namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa namo tassa bhagavato arahato samma sambuddhassa พุทธังธรรมังสังขังนมัสสามิ So the traditional words paying homage to the Buddha, homage to the blessed, the noble, the perfectly enlightened one, and then at the end I said พุทธังธรรมังสังขังนมัสสามิ Very simple. I bow down or I revere the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha. So first, maybe I just start with a question. Does anybody here not know who the uh, cartoonist Lat is? Is everybody familiar with Lat? So see straight away some smiles, right? It's very special. So I was growing up in England and coming to Malaysia on holiday throughout my childhood in the 70s. And then one year must have been, you know, maybe in the late 70s. Uh, after a holiday, we brought back one of the first, you know, albums. I'm sure you you might remember the kind of black. It's like an album compilation. The, some of the early cartoon scenes of Malaysian life. It was Lat or lots more Lat or one of those things. And there was the black one and then the green one and then Lat Kampong Boy and Town Boy. Remember? So for me, uh, living in England, knowing that I have a kind of connection to Malaysia, I've been there on holiday and going to places like Penang. Trungganu and Kuantan, and visiting relatives here in KL, but also knowing that that contact with Malaysia was it was very limited. You know, you go and stay in a hotel in Penang, or you stay in a hotel in KT or something, and visit Tioman. It's very a kind of superficial experience, and without realizing who or what this was, you know, just one day began to read it. My sister was older, kind of got into it first, and you know, opened up a whole new. You could say vista, a whole new view on not only Malaysia, but also on humor, on comedy, on art, and on life itself. And you know why I bring that up is because I'm sure all of you, many of you, had that same experience of growing up. What is it was so brilliant about Lat? You know, even for somebody who's not Malaysian, like I wasn't really familiar with the themes and the characters that were being used or being shown and the, the humor. But I think what we all get the feeling from, of course, is One, somebody who doesn't take themselves too seriously, who really you just love this person because here's somebody who is just not at all self-conscious about who they are, no pretensions, very much this is who I am, <laughs> yeah. and also doesn't really love clearly love society or love the people around him, family, the kampong, the ways. Everything that he went, you know, very much loving it in the sense of loving the humor of human life. He's just presenting us with what the world is like. Didn't have to make any special jokes. Just say, look, yeah, this is how somebody sells peanuts, or this is how somebody eats their noodles, and it's just funny because he, you know, just captures it. And there's something very sweet, very endearing, and there's something about us in that. And so this idea that basically the world—it's like a stage, or it's like a play. It's like something to look at and enjoy, and to find something uh, funny and uplifting, as well as touching at times, sad, but in just a nice way where you don't take it seriously. You enjoy it. Don't take yourself seriously. Don't take the world too seriously. And so I've often thought of that you know, since then. And I later, over the late years, I got into Dharma practice, and I often thought to myself, you know. Lat really got it somehow, and it's always felt like he was my my early Dharma teacher growing up, teaching me the funny side of life, the funny side of my own life, not to take myself too seriously, and how to look around at other people and situations, and laugh, but not in a nasty way. Laugh in the sense of yes, my fellow man or my fellow woman. This is the kind of thing that happens in life. So one thing is, I you know, I hope. All of you know these images and these cartoons, and um, you know, think about them. I just like to offer that as a first Dharma reflection. Think about Lat, and think about why it's such a kind of brilliant way of looking at the world or looking at life, and try to cultivate that sense yourself. Often, it's the sense of very, almost like innocent or childlike eyes, a way of looking at the world. 
often looking at the adult world like aren't adults silly and in a sense but that's true isn't it a lot of what we do really is silly and a lot of why we experience what's called dukkha dukkha means that which is hard to bear it's not always like suffering like oh i'm suffering or oh, my i've got death in the family or economy's in crisis it's more just the dukkha of just things being difficult or awkward situations or or hopes and uh, dreams which we have which may or may not be realized say moving from ipo to kuala lumpur as a young man or young boy young woman that's the dukkha of life you don't know what's going to happen you're just little you in this big city and that's what the world is it's like little me in this big uh, big wide world and so a lot of the dukkha we have is that similar kind of dukkha we don't know what to do what to say how is it going to be but the beauty of lat was that he could somehow enjoy that and then later transmit that to other people sort of tra- dharma transmission via cartoon and so i've often thought since then this is an important thing to try and remember and try and think a lot about and not never to lose that feeling if i can is very difficult because you get older and then you get very serious and then the issues become serious and you have to you know you begin to worry about things and so in a sense to talk to everyone here tonight and uh, most of you have come maybe come to bobs trying to practice and dharma in your life and it's very nice it's a very wholesome thing to be doing and then luckily i'm sure you have a lot of understanding via teachings these days there are monks coming to teach lay people teaching there's books there's the internet there's cds there's the you know links online there's the whole range of ways which you can learn about the dharma and it can be both theoretical like people are studying abhidhamma and people are studying all kinds of things and it can be very practice based people are doing meditation retreats people are doing practicing uh, meditation at home many many ways that the dharma can manifest in people's lives but there's always this question which you know comes up monks get asked or you ask each other well how do you let go when you're in a very difficult situation or you have families and you have jobs even today i'm being asked well you know i have anger but then if i don't have anger then will i still have ambition you know so how do you let go or there's a difficult situation at home with your children you know how do you let go all of these kind of things and i think it's very difficult to let go of things when you create a strong sense of these things being you could say real and important so one way to think if you like is very much trying to see the world and this is the buddha said this in so many times in so many ways to use different language sometimes seeing the world as a magician's trick or as empty or as constantly changing or as unstable all of these kinds of things to really you could say really believe that really cultivate the vision or the perspective or the attitude look much as you might try to control things the way you would like them to come out and to to find certainty in the world even certainty in buddhism what is the buddhist teachings and how to use them so that you can grow in sila samadhi panya that it's very very difficult to find certainty outside because ultimately we're just receiving information or sight sound smells tastes the world if we talk about the world in terms of countries and politics and the environment and issues these things are not really in our control so uh, there's so many millions and billions of factors going into what happens in the world we're not really going to find any certainty there and even the way we experience the world comes through what you could call a lens not just the lens of your eyes but then the lens in a sense your ears have a lens you know some people hearing better than others or the lens of your ears some people speak chinese some people speak bahasa some people speak english we all have different 
lenses in our ears or in our minds, but what we hear, sound, is different from person to person. And ultimately, what we then create in terms of our understanding of the outside world varies from person to person. So it's kind of the same, like we can say, okay, be here at 8.30, and generally we all understand that, so we all come here at 8.30. You know, that's what we call a convention, something we agree on. But in many ways, and that's why there's often arguments and conflicts, is that different people have different, you could say, different takes on things or different responses. People feel differently about different things, understand things in different ways, different attitudes or values. And so, as we practice Dharma, I think a very important thing to really try to develop is this sense that we don't really know quite what's going on around us. We don't really understand it. The Buddha said, if I remember the Pali, yena yena himanyati tatta nanghoti anyata. So whatever, whatever you think it is, it will be different or it is actually different. Not maybe totally different, but it's not quite, it's never quite what we think. You know, when you really believe that or think about that or hopefully see it in your own life, that's a very good way to begin the process of letting go. Why be so sure about something that you see is actually different a lot of the time? Beginning to think about the world a bit like a play or a bit like a Latin cartoon. You know, look around and just see all these funny figures. We could do a very nice little Latin cartoon about a meditation group, you know, with all the funny faces and the funny people, you know, the medit- one person meditating like this and the really, really kind of intense meditator, you know. It could be really kind of quite funny and that, that's what the world is like, you know. He, I'm sure he would do a really funny, you know, sketch, you know, about a meditation center and we would all see it and really laugh and we'd say, yeah, that's me, you know, that's him, and that's her. And it would be funny and we don't take ourselves too seriously because it's, yeah, we're saying it, it's not really like, it's not really who who we are, and there's not that certainty that we're, we're always, always looking for. And so this is something I think, you know, people can do. You have the, the steps of sila, you know, ethics and conduct. Hopefully you'll keep the five precepts. Now you understand why you keep the five precepts. It just keeps your life safe to a certain degree. It keeps your life free from getting lost in too much confusion. The five precepts are your external support. But that just gives you the basis or the foundation for doing something more. You have dana, which is generosity. And that is also an attitude of mind where you're, rather than saying, me and mine, and I want this and I want that, you're going the opposite direction. You're, you're giving, you're being kind, you're being generous. So these are things which you understand very well. But what's it for? It's all leading towards basically letting go of, or letting go of what? So things like, okay, greed and anger and negativity and dukkha, but, but how? Again, this begins by letting go of this sense that the outside world is a bit of a, a stage play, a bit of a comedy. And you look around these days, sometimes it really is quite funny, funny world out there. A lot of strange things going on. And then you look at your life and the things you do. Do you ever do some pretty weird things which you later think, wow, that was a bit funny. Or that didn't, wasn't really so good. Or or whatever. But realizing and just seeing that, you know, who you think you are is often a little bit different. Just that much. Just knowing that there's a little bit of a difference. Sometimes a lot of difference. And that's how to, a very good inroad a very way into what we could say letting go people talk about anger and and craving and these kind of things and sometimes we have to reduce them externally you feel angry so you practice metta we're familiar with that sometimes you feel craving sensual craving you just maybe just say no that's that's not wholesome or try to let go of that find the middle way but i think it's something we can all do is is just look inwards, ask yourself, who is this person who's angry? Who is this person who's craving? Somebody just showed me a little 
kind of like a little trick, a little skillful means. Last week I was in the monastery in the jungle in Thailand and uh, one of my friends was giving a Dhamma talk. And he said, you know, we often talk in Buddhism about say, emptiness and non-self. And so this is a bit of a trick or a bit of a, a kind of image. But he said, okay, and you can try this now. It's very safe. You will have a finger. So if you point your finger at yourself like this, you see, if you point your finger at yourself, say, now look at what your finger's pointing at. You can try. Don't be shy. And it looks a bit silly, but you see, like, point at your, say, your eyes, okay? And now, now focus at what your finger is pointing at. Do you see what I mean? Get this. Your finger is pointing at, what do you see? There's basically what you can see, what it's pointing at. If you look in front of your finger, it's kind of pointing in your direction, but it's pointing at emptiness. You see that? All you, what you can see, if you look at the thing that the finger is pointing at, what you can see is empty space. Okay. So you think, okay, so it's a bit of a kind of ec false external trick. You always say, no, but I'm, I'm here. You know, I'm, I know I'm here. But I'm just saying, but just as a reminder, your finger points at you. Now look at what your finger's pointing at. Okay? Your finger points at you. Now look at what it's pointing at. Oh, it's pointing at emptiness. You see, that, what that, I can see, that's all I can see between, you know, in front of my finger is empty space. So these are ways to, a little, you could say, a trick or a reminder not to take yourself too seriously. Now, and this, this is really important because you know, once you take yourself seriously, then it's very hard not to get too involved in a situation and then basically suffer. This is all about dukkha, which means stress, suffer, we say sorrow, lamentation, pain, grief, despair, any kind of subtle, I don't like this can be a little annoyance, can be too hot, a little bit too hot, a little bit too cold, anything. But if you change your perspective and approach things with a sort of sense of emptiness, well, like who is here anyway? That really changes things. If you understand, just understanding that everything we experience is a product of lots and lots of causes and conditions, hundreds, thousands, millions, billions from the past, right here in the present, sometimes random coincidences. Did you have the, ever have that thought that if things had been a bit different, you never would have been born? I'm sure you had that thought. You know, the fluke shot of being born. <laughs> so why are you taking it so seriously? And you know, where's the world going? You, know, you can't think, I mean, who knows? And the thing is, this is the way to basically to be a bit lighter. Now, most people won't just stop working and just suddenly then just sit down and say, well, just sit here and do nothing till I die. You still carry on doing everything, but hopefully just with a bit of a different perspective, that's all. Feeling lighter, not feeling so serious, and then maybe not being so driven to do certain things. Because craving, what we call craving or desire, needs a very solid sense of certainty begins with the I, so I want this, so this has got to be certain, and the result has got to be certain, and the thing you want to get your result, all of those things, they feel very real. So when you begin the process of saying, you know, maybe yes, maybe no, you're stepping back, you're beginning to free yourself up from being basically a bit of a victim. You can all think of like, think of how, say in the world, things like advertising tries to manipulate people. And it works very well, actually. That's why so much money is spent on advertising. It's very effective. So you begin to step back from that by thinking, maybe yes, maybe no. Well, who? Even if you are stimulated to maybe buy something, thinking, well, really? Do I have to? Does this thing really mean something? Does it really? All of these things. In a sense, this is what you, the value of, of you could say, taking the, the lat approach to life or the lat approach to dharma practice is a very very i think a very very effective one because you don't get so caught up in the first place this year in thailand i've seen a change which could be in a sense very worrying or i've seen it very clearly now within my eyes that in terms of the the environment that i live in it's a jungle in the west of thailand we've got very little water 
and it's very dry, it's forest fires, in a place which used to be very, very damp, beautiful jungle. And it could be a bit of a, a fluke this year with very poor rainfall during the rainy season, and then now a very long period uh, dry, so no rain yet. But then when I think about it, I've been living there, going there on and off for 20 years now. Every year, the, the streams have been dropping and dropping and dropping and dropping until this year for the first time. Second time, one stream ran out, the big stream, there's hardly any water. The forest fires come in. And so, in one sense, of course, for the monastery and for the environment and for the future, you can get, you can think, oh no, this is really bad, this is really terrible. What are we going to do? But that doesn't help the situation, it's not going to change anything. And Dharma practice has been teaching us all along that change and decline is the nature of things anyway. It was the Buddha's last teaching, Vaya Dhamma Sankara, that change is the nature of all phenomena, Apama Dena Sampadeta, strive with diligence, so put forth effort, you know, understand the Dhamma, let go. And then also, but when you do that, when you let go and you're okay, doesn't mean you don't still respond appropriately. We build fire breaks, we run up and down, we check it's safe, we light a counter fire. Many, many things you can do, but without dukkha, without worrying about it. And ultimately, if the forest, we've all been saying, if the forest burns down, if, if the Dhamma hall burns down, if everything burns down, actually, like, never mind. It's, it's got to disintegrate at some point anyway. It was never permanent. It's just bamboo. It's just wood. It's just metal. We're safe. We're okay. Okay, then when it's burned down, then we'll decide, okay, are we going to rebuild it, or are we just going to, you know, just say it's too dangerous, whatever. You can, you can approach the same situation, but without worrying about it. We don't have to get stressed out. So I'm sure you know there's this big uh, slogan going around the world on, on mugs and posters saying, keep calm and carry on. Have you seen that one? Last few years, big kind of trending globally. It actually began, I don't know if you know the story of that poster, it began, it was printed in England during the Second World War. In the beginning of the Second World War, the German army under Hitler were very, very effective. And it, it seemed almost impossible that they wouldn't actually manage to invade the UK. And the British government knew that. And so basically had no option. There's nothing really they could do. But one thing they decided to do was just print hundreds of thousands of posters with this sort of reassuring writing and a little image of the crown and just put it up. They never put them up, but they had them ready if it really looked like the invasion was going to take place, that they would put them up. And that was all they could do. And it was kind of like a, a Dharma approach. And what can you do? You just keep calm and carry on. Just to keep people calm. Ultimately, we just can keep calm and carry on. It didn't work out that way, various reasons. I won't go into the history now. And the world would have been very different. But that's, I think, a very good little slogan for life. That's why it kind of went round. People think it's funny, but it's something we should really, really apply to our lives. Because obviously, when you have to respond, it is more effective and better to respond from a place of calm than from a place of panic. And you can turn things round. Even then, it's not sure how it will be, but you can do that. So everyone here, you know, coming, listening to a Dharma talk, uh, hopefully wanting to practice Dharma and... For what? For the purpose of to understand. It's to lighten the load, to lighten things up. I was talking to somebody today, the Malaysian word for goods or stuff is like barang, barang, barang. And I think it may well be linked to the Pali word bhara, which means a burden or a weight. A lot of words in Bahasa, as you know, come from Sanskrit, Pali. And so we're trying to lighten our barang, barang, you know, like less is more, you know, put down the burden. It's one of Buddha said, Ohitabaru, you've thrown off the burden. Ohitabaru. And that's really what we're trying to do. The burden of me, myself, and I, who I am, this solid me, means that the external burden is lighter. You don't get so caught up in it. Even the thing in the middle that you might get caught up with is lighter. It's not so serious. In fact, it's not even really there unless you really make it something special. So I think, I think it's something all of us can understand. And, and like I say, I really want to, in a sense, nice, to pay, again, pay tribute to my childhood hero, Lat. Just think about him, you know, think, or think about that way of relating. There's something very, very dharmic 
about that. At least in my opinion, it, the the humor wasn't being nasty or judging or like laughing at people. It was very much a way of, of sharing, bringing to light, in terms of light bringing to light, bringing to consciousness, but also making light of life situation, and saying, "Yeah, this is how it is. This is how it is." And it's also it's very touching. So many of the the cartoons or the strips actually would show people working together, people helping each other in times of difficulty or family type situations, you know, little stories about how a wedding takes place and all these kind of funny things. It's like the human stories. It was almost like before reality TV, you know, you had luck basically, but it was much better, I think, and never really watched reality TV, but that's the kind of thing. Well, why it meant so much was it was real. It was presenting reality in a way which was comforting, soothing, light-hearted, humorous, and it made you feel good. You went away feeling, so what was that? That's the Dharma factor, the kind of letting go factor, I think. So Dharma doesn't have to be like serious and from the Tripitaka and Pali and lists like, you know, the Eightfold Path. It can be, it's very much to do with bringing the spirit of lightness, ease, not so serious, uh, letting go in, into our lives, into our conversations knowing also you know, being very careful today I was just talking to some people we can often justify anger based on the fact that one we're, we're right righteousness but also thinking that if I'm angry then I'll you know say something and that person will learn or they will do it properly that kind of thing or if there's that sort of anger then you get your way um, but In my experience, I've never known anger to be a positive uh, force in any situation. And I think uh, the one thing, as if you were to talk about being a Buddhist or appreciating the teachings of the Lord Buddha, the one thing we can say is that there's never any room for anger or for violence or for negativity. It doesn't mean you don't know what's correct and not correct and what's wholesome and unwholesome and blameworthy and blameless. But we never need to bring anger or negativity into it. And it's like, obviously, this, these days, it's a big issue for religion. And even in the Buddhist religion, I'm sure you know, there's a lot of places where people get very angry. It can be big anger, or it can be small anger, like in committee meetings, or, you know, big stuff, you know, militant Buddhism, these things we're seeing, he's going to see the ugly side. But we know, you have to know, that this is never going to be the Dharma. And it's actually very, very important because we're never going to take, we should never be taking ourselves so seriously or even the Dharma of the Buddha to the point where you get angry about it or would harm another being. The Buddha gave a beautiful simile, which maybe many of you will be familiar with. It's the simile of the raft. And simply to put, say it very, very simply, the Buddha said he taught the Dharma for the purpose of crossing over. He said, Suppose there were a man on a near shore, on this shore, this side of a river, and this side was beset or was full of dangers. And then there was a farther shore, the other side, which was free from danger, but there was no boat, there was no bridge. So that man would take grass, or twigs, sticks, logs, and bind it together and make a raft, and using hands and feet would paddle across to the other side. Now having reached the other side, would that man lift up that raft, put it on his head, and walk around with it. Yeah, the Buddha asked the monks. And the monks said, no, Lord. He said, what would he do with it? He would either haul it up onto dry land and go about his business, or just let it go in the stream. Why? Because he's done its job. So the Buddha then makes this very, very powerful statement. He says, so too, monks, I have taught the Dharma for the purpose of crossing over, not for the purpose of holding on to. And he said, even wholesome dhammas should be let go of, let alone the unwholesome dhammas. Now that's a very profound statement, very powerful. The Buddha teaches the dhamma for the purpose of crossing over, not for holding on to. And so at the very least, we know you can say if you have anger arising, whether it's in life or over Buddhist issues or over any issue, that's not the middle way. This is very, very clear. And it's a very high standard. So as a community here, you could say the, the family of Bubs, be very careful not to indulge each other in righteous indignation, angry speech, 
These days it could be about politics, people talking about all kinds of things, the environment or the toilets. It can be anything, from big things to little things, arguments. You can discuss anything, have lots of opinions, that's fine, but being very careful of the fire of anger, which is always bound up with this sense of self, I'm right and you're wrong. And it's often bound up with fear. If we don't get angry, it'll just, you know, it'll all go horribly wrong. When you have the lap approach to Dharma, you don't get so angry, do you? It's like, it's okay. Not a, not a big problem. We'll survive. Keep calm and carry on. Okay, so I've just been talking a bit. It's nice to see everybody here. Just encourage you to keep calm and carry on. You never know what is going to happen tomorrow, but if you have a foundation in the present moment, have sila in your lives, good five precepts, really rock solid, generous, you have brahma viharas like metta, loving kindness, compassion, mudita, joy with other people, and upeka, equanimity. Upeka means looking at something. Peka is to look at. Upeka means looking on. And that's like that, yeah? When you look at the world from a distance, like you're watching a slightly funny, strange movie, which you're kind of one of the actors, as well as a bit the director, producer, writer, but also the audience. Never forget, you're also watching, and you can't really control everybody else. Upeka means you're looking on, you're thinking, oh, that's what's happening. And what can you do? Okay, keep calm and carry on. And this is, I think, a way to really bring Dharma practice into your lives. You go on meditation courses, that's good. Study the Abhidharma or whatever, that, that can help. But uh, Dharma is about living and feeling ease, you know, feeling happy, just feeling good. And the key principle is obviously that feeling of good is here. It's in you. Everyone is as good as each other. Everyone has as... We have everything we need within us, with this body, with this mind. You have one, one bowl of food a day, or for you maybe three three bowls a day, maybe four, five, and that's enough. Actually, anything more than that is a burden. It's your barang barang, so put down the burden. Okay, so I'll end there, said enough for tonight, so I wish you all the best. Very nice to see you all again. Just take care. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. We shall now open to the floor for a few questions. Please confine your question to Dhamma related? Um, Ajahn, sometimes I get very complacent in my practice in the sense that I feel like my life is pretty fine, I'm okay. So how do I arouse this like spiritual urgency to, to sort of understand dukkha, to feel like you know I have to practice? Like Sometimes I just feel fine. Yeah, I think it's a good question. I mean, you're very lucky in some sense that you know you feel fine, feel nice, that's good. But it's true, if, if you're aware that there's complacency, you know, complacency, people maybe don't know. It's just this sense of, it's good enough, I'm doing fine, I don't need to really strive. I mean, you know, one very simple thing is just to be really honest, though, with yourself and just do a little thought experiment. Is that, you know, if you were to experience, you know, a sudden onset of illness or parental death or separation from the things you like, I mean, are you really ready for that? Just look at your own body, your own aging process, and just realize that this very, very limited time you've got in this sense, in the state of being okay. Look around at other people and seeing dukkha in other people and other people's lives. You know, the Buddha said there's, there's four kinds of thoroughbred horse. Four kinds of thoroughbred horse. One kind is that you have to kind of whip it hard until the, the flesh, is, the skin splits and then it will run. And another kind uh, you have to hit it once and it runs. Uh, the third kind, you just touch it with the whip yeah, and it runs. And then the fourth kind, even if it sees out of its eye the shadow of the whip on the ground, and then it runs. And so the Buddha said, similarly, there are four types of people. Some people, they have to experience real, real dukkha before they get encouraged and arouse urgency to practice. Some people have to experience a little bit. You know, that's the one they get hit and then they, oh yeah. Some people, they just have to feel the prick. Yeah, so that's, they see it in somebody else. Oh, one of their relatives gets sick or one of their 
you know, something happens to somebody else. And some people, even to hear that in another village somebody got old is enough to encourage them. So yeah, even the Buddha is saying, yeah, we're all different, you know, so maybe you need to wait until you get a bit of a... <laughs> you know what, I can't, you know, help you. You know, it's good though that you want to get out of your complacency is good. So, you know, I don't know, watch the news, that should be enough to, <laughs> to, to fill you with horror. <laughs> Look at, you know, contemplate. But I want you to just ask yourself, are you really, are you really ready for a major separation from that which you, that which you love? You know, create, just create a, I mean, I can do that myself. I can even create a scenario where something really terrible happens to me or my family or something like that. Just to, you know, do that and just to see, oh yeah. Yeah, I mean, I'm not free from attachment. So you have two options. You can say, well, Okay, no, don't worry, that probably won't happen anyway. Or you can say, yeah, better strive. So just kind of keep inclining your mind in that direction. I mean, okay, maybe old age sickness and death isn't, you know, enough to shake you, which is fine. Not everybody, you know, most will say, yeah, so what? I'll get old, get sick, get die. Yes, that's okay. I'm okay with that. But other things. And then it may just be like, you know, not your time yet. Whatever, we're all very different. This, this Dharma is very mysterious. There are seven billion people on the planet. Not everyone is the same. So it's just good enough. Just keep coming to bubs, coming to listen to talks, just do whatever <laughs> practice, you know. You, you know, you'll get into it. You just keep looking in the right direction. Keep contemplating. Even if you're not sort of uh, feeling the urgency, do the practice anyway. You see, you don't have to feel like, oh my God, you know, it's all terrible. I better practice. Well, you're here tonight. It's good enough. So just keep doing it anyway. They always say you must have goals and and law of attraction and all these type of things, right? And what? Which, sorry, law of attraction. Law of attraction. Isn't it more like like predicting the future? We are looking towards. We are actually creating the future. Mm-hmm. And if we don't strive to the future, mm-hmm. wouldn't it lead to suffering? Mm-hmm. What's your take on that? Mm-hmm. I think it's important to have goals. That's called atta in Pali, atta, A-double-T-H-A. Atta, an attanyuta is a quality of a wise person, is one who knows the goal. And then dhammanyuta is one who knows the dhammas or the things, the causes and conditions that lead to that goal. It's the first two qualities of a wise person. So yes, it's important. And it's also true to say that those goals are effectively created by you, in a sense that you decide or you're the one who's creating this sense of this is a goal I want to aim for. Nobody else can create a goal for you. They can try. Your parents can say, yeah, you have to be a doctor. But if you don't really want to, yeah, <laughs> nothing they can do. So yes, you create the goals and you should do. And while you're doing that, yes, there is still craving. There's always craving in the, the mind of an unenlightened person. But it doesn't mean it's bad. Then as you walk the path and you create your future, The important thing is to know the goal as a goal and the present as the present and then not get confused between the two. So you're not so emotionally invested in the goal that if it doesn't work out or it's differently, that then you experience dukkha. You see, so you need the two. The simile the Thai Krupa Ajans give is like if you're driving a car, you're going on a journey. You have to know where you're going. So maybe it's like up a mountain or to Ipo or something like that. You have to know if a goal is going to Ipo. And maybe every now and then you you know you look ahead if it's a mountain or you you look at the signs in Ipo you know and you check you're still going in the right direction, but for the most part, actually your mindfulness and your awareness is within the present, the vicinity of the car, and those two things are not in conflict with each other. See, people kind of think, well, if you're in the present moment, then you can never have a goal about the future. But being in the present moment doesn't mean only only thinking and being in the present moment and. Being in the present means that knowing you're here now and that you're on the way to there, but also knowing that that's still a fantasy. Know your goal is a play, as the fiction, but which you may or may not realize through your putting the right causes and conditions. So it's actually a very good question. Understand this, that you create wholesome goals, know what's wholesome, know what's unwholesome, know what's conducive to your lack of dukkha, and what makes more dukkha. Sometimes you have these kind of hard lessons in life before you learn and then avoid the unwholesome goals, cultivate wholesome goals. But as you do it, 
stay emotionally and in terms of mindfulness, know that you're here now. And all you can do is put the right causes and conditions into place. And then in a sense, actually, if you really stay in the present moment, you have a feeling that the goal is moving towards you. Because if you're really in the present, you know, you're not kind of going anywhere. Suddenly it's just getting closer and closer and closer and closer. And one day you say you realize your goal, which means you've made it real. But where do you make it real? When you realize it, where are you? You're in the present. So actually don't go anywhere. Just let your goal come towards you. <laughs> okay, I think it's a good place to stop. So I wish everybody safe, happy, safe journey home. Sadu, sad, sad.